Welcome back, everyone. So we are continuing last class. We worked on uh, singular perturbation theory. Remember, perturbation methods are our way of approximating solutions we can't solve. There are two general classes, uh, regular perturbations, which are typically more straightforward, and singular perturbations, which are a bit more challenging, as we saw last class. Um, you know, we did we did the last class. We worked on a problem with uh, polynomials, and I think the benefit of that is you know how to solve that equation, and so approximating it is kind of is there's a, a bit of a comfort zone you're in as you start approximating it because you kind of know what the answer should be, so you know if you're doing it right or wrong. Um, so I think in that sense, it's really easy to see what the the singular nature of that problem is. I think it's kind of easy to wrap your head around the solution. However, I think it kind of feels a little divorced from like problems that you might encounter in your research. And the, I don't know, I feel like there's, at least for me, there's something with like a polynomial equation where it's like, we only have one of the roots we expect to. You're kind of like, well, I got one solution. <laughs> there's a little bit of like, which is the wrong approach. Don't, don't feel that way. But I do think today we're going to focus on uh, a boundary value problem. So a differential equation. And I think here you will really see quite quickly like the mathematical and physical consequences of, of trying to approximate a singular, uh, a problem that is singular. Um, I think this one will make a bit more sense, even though it'll be kind of harder. Um, I, I think you'll probably Maybe it'll sink in a little bit of like, oh yeah, okay, I can, this makes sense. And it's going to involve some terms you've likely heard if you've read any kind of papers in, that utilize methods from applied math. In particular, you know, in your fluid mechanics courses, you've probably encountered things like uh, boundary layers, the ideas of, of boundary layers, and really common in fluid uh, in fluids. In particular, the simplest example I think of a, of a boundary layer in fluids is, you know, you have a flow going over an airfoil or a wing, and you kind of know intuitively that far away from the, from the wing, the flow will behave like one thing, and then right near the wing, the flow will behave a little bit differently. Well, because why? Well, there's some no-slip boundary condition near that wing where we expect uh, the flow to be qualitatively different. And so then, therefore, you know in your head, like, okay, near the wing, it should be, the flow will be like this, away from the wing, it should be like this. There should be some transition between those two. What do I mean by near the wing? Well, that's the width of the boundary layer. And then how do I kind of construct an approximation um, for that type of system? Another example of boundary layers in solid mechanics are uh, if you take a tennis ball and you cut it in half and you turn it inside out, you, if you can imagine this thought experiment, the rim of the tennis ball, once you've turned it inside out, will kind of be flat. If you can picture that really briefly, it'll kind of go from being like a half of a circle to like a half of a circle that kind of has a little flat edge there. That's a boundary layer. That is a boundary layer that is trying to match the fact that you're not applying a moment to the edge of that, of that shell. So the moment at the edge is zero, well, you've changed the curvature everywhere. So you have kind of in the bulk of the shell near the apex, it looks just like a regular hemisphere, but then near the boundary, it behaves quite differently because it has to uh, match the fact that there's really no moment there to kind of keep that thing bent. So it splays out. So that's a boundary layer in, in a solid mechanics problem. And typically both in the, the turbulence problem and the, uh, the elastic stability problem of a, of a thin shell, you can't solve any of the equations to predict what the shape of these things are going to be analytically, uh, except in really particular regimes. Um, and so what you end up doing is you have to kind of approximate what your solutions are going to be. And you're, what you end up doing is what we're doing today, which is approximating the solution far away from the boundary and then approximating the solution in the boundary and then matching those two solutions. So these are concepts of boundary layers and matched asymptotics. Uh, this is, if you've heard those terms before, this is what we'll be doing today. Um, I should note, I sent out before class a homework assignment. I think this one will be a little bit tricky 
Um, so I would start it soon. It's due in a week. Uh, the first part of it is polynomials, and that shouldn't be too bad. And then it moves into some differential equations. The last part of it, I don't think you'll be able to do until after today's lecture, uh, possibly after Tuesday's lecture, but I think you should have the, the bulk of it needed today. And so before I jump in, I would like to take questions that you might have either conceptually, mathematically, or implementing these things as we've been doing it in Mathematica. What's kind of the state of the state of the class, the state of the union for all of us? How are we doing on this stuff? There were some questions that me. I'll monitor the chat. How come I can see it over there? I'm not on the Ah, okay. How do I want the homework done? I don't care. Um, I think you should do it in whichever way is uh, easier for you. I feel like if you don't do it with some sort of uh, mathematical tool, uh, computational tool, it'll be hard to kind of easily plot and compare your answers, especially if you're trying to compare it. In some of the cases, you're going to have to solve some of the problems numerically. I'll go over how to do that today. Um, so I don't particularly care what you use. I think you'll find it easier to have me help you troubleshoot your problems. If you are doing a Mathematica, because you can just send me your math Mathematica code and say, why is this not working? And I can try to help, but we can jump on zoom. Um, you'll probably want to do it with something, um, at the very least, just to kind of plot your solutions. But the extent to which you utilize Mathematica can be up to you. Like you could do it all on pen and paper and then just kind of plot your solutions along with the numerical one just to make sure things are right and that's fine with me. I don't know if it, I feel like there's usually a lot of confusion about these types of problems. So I don't know if it's just that we haven't had a chance to, to practice them. Yeah, I'm sure once we get into the yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that I will, I want to get into these boundary layer problems just to give you kind of a more, I don't know, more, a way to connect this, this idea to stuff that is probably more familiar with you. Um, but again, it'll just keep using and reinforcing the same idea. So I hope you'll, you'll stop me and ask questions um, uh, as they come up. So I guess let me get into it here. I'll do some of this with, um, oops, with pen and paper. Or like on the, sorry, on the, on the iPad um, before doing some Mathematica stuff just to kind of mix it up a little bit. There we go. I found a fitting tweet uh a meme if you will uh that i thought you would all enjoy tropical storm epsilon is making its way to us and as epsilon grows bigger mathematicians everywhere are freaking out all right so let's talk about boundary layers and to do so what i want to do i think this might be our first boundary value problem um and so we're going to look at here. So here's the boundary layer problem we're going to look at. And it looks like epsilon. Oops. Epsilon times the second derivative 
of y plus 2 times y prime plus 2y equals 0. And here, this is valid over the domain uh, between 0 and 1 for x. This is a second order ordinary differential equation. So we need two boundary conditions. Those boundary conditions are imposing the location of y. So the first one is that y at x of 0 equals 0. And the second is that y at x of 1 equals 1. As you recall, boundary value problems are generally harder to solve than initial value problems. If you conceptually want to know why an initial value problem is like taking a bow and arrow and launching it with some angle and initial velocity, a boundary value problem is taking a bow and arrow, launching it with some initial velocity and having it match up with a location at where that arrow goes at the end, which is clearly harder than just firing an arrow off into the sky. That idea of kind of, you have to know where you're starting and you have to know where you're going um, makes these problems a lot harder to solve. Nonetheless, this is a second order ODE with constant coefficients, which means the coefficients on the derivatives don't have any dependence on X. Um, we can solve this equation analytically and I'll try not to make you dizzy by switching back and forth too much, but I just want to show you what the solution looks like. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. So this is our second order ODE. Looks pretty familiar. You should know how to input these things by now. Boundary condition one, boundary condition two, the analytical solution looks quite messy. It's this whole complicated bunch of exponentials. But what I, the reason why I wanted to show you this and show you how this solves is to, is to give you an example of um, what the solution looks like as we vary epsilon. So this is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, so right now I'm just going to delete these and replot it. So. Okay. Here you can see the behavior of the solution. I picked an epsilon that's small, 0.01, and you see that when you're far away from the origin, the solution has one type of behavior. And you can pretty clearly see that at, y, at x is equal to one, y is equal to one, that's great. And we know that, so it's kind of like going from x is equal to one, it's increasing, 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 but we know that the first boundary condition tells us it has to drop back down to be equal to zero at y of zero, which is exactly what it does. And now we can see what happens as we start increasing epsilon. So what I'm going to do, let's see if I can make this work without breaking it. Is Epsilon of 0.01 to 1. Oops. All right, cool. Does it work? Uh, do I have to tell it to evaluate? Ah, oh, that would have been so nice. Why is that not working? Ah, oh, sorry. Well, I will fix that later when I upload this. I will have to just do it visually for now. So it doesn't know how to do this. So I tell it that epsilon, we did 0.01. We've got a curve, that looks nice. Now let's vary it, we'll vary it a little bit more dramatically. 
you can start to see that that region in which it drops to zero expands. 0.07, expanding further, 0.1, Five. Oh no, what happened? Okay, point six. You can see that that region over which it's decaying from some maximum value to zero is expanding. That's what's termed the width of the boundary layer. And the width of the boundary layer is increasing with our, the, the magnitude of um, of epsilon. So conceptually, we can we can see that right off the bat, and we're able to do that because this is a problem we can solve analytically. So let me just sketch out what that looks like. So we have it over here. Um, so I'm plotting y of x and what we have is something that's like squiggles. And so this is what's occurring as we decrease epsilon. And this region over here, so I'll draw this with the red one. This is the width of our boundary layer. And that width is increasing as epsilon increases. Okay. There's actually a lot we can ascertain from how that width scales with, that, with epsilon, which we'll come back to in a little bit. In particular, one of the things that we can, can pick up on is how to rescale this equation for the singular perturbation. But for right now, we can, we can hold off and just start as we normally would when we're trying to approximate an equation. And we start by doing the regular perturbation. When we are looking at uh, boundary value problems, approximating uh, ODEs and PDEs, the, that regular perturbation, the step in which we're looking at the regular perturbation, is typically what's termed the outer solution. Uh, outer, in a sense, it's in a reference to, to the origin, but that outer solution can kind of, as we get to more complicated problems, generally mean like away from the boundaries. So in particular, we're going to talk, I don't think today, maybe, but on a problem that has multiple boundary layers, and that outer solution is kind of the one that's away from the boundaries. Here, the outer solution is when there's just one boundary layer, it's referring to what's happening away from uh, that uh, the origin. And so we're going to just start with a regular perturbation. The outer solution. And again, we do what we always do, which is we assume that our, we know our solution, and we assume that our solution is that y is proportional to y naught at x uh, plus epsilon y1 at x plus epsilon squared y2 at x, and so on and so forth. So we assume that that's our solution. We take our guess and we insert it back into our differential equation. So we know what this looks like. This looks like epsilon times y double prime not plus epsilon y1 double prime plus 2 times y prime
So hopefully it's kind of immediately clear to you that this was originally y double prime, y prime, and y, and we have our original uh, equation back. And then we also have to do this for our two boundary conditions, such that uh, the first one is that First one is that why not? Uh, oops, that's not an x, it's just a zero. The first one is that at x is equal to zero, our new uh, solution for y has to equal zero. And the second one is that at our position x is equal to one, we expect the value of y to be equal to one. So far, so good. Okay, I'm going to copy this. Let's see here. And so at order one, we just do what we always do. This is repetitive, but it'll get interesting in just a moment. So order one, what we're doing is we want to retain all terms in which we take epsilon to zero. So at order one, this entire term goes away. We know immediately by seeing that epsilon multiplying the highest order derivative in our problem, so the epsilon is multiplying y double prime, that this is going to be a singular perturbation problem. And we see it here now too. We just lost kind of a really important term in our equation. We're also going to kill all these terms and all these terms. And this thing at order one reduces to something a little bit more straightforward, which is that 2y not. Oops, that's awful. Make this smaller. So after removing all these terms, we find that 2y not prime plus 2y not is equal to 0. And our boundary conditions tell us this. Turn our attention just to this equation right here, this differential equation, and this should be really familiar to you. It should be hopefully pretty straightforward for you to, to solve. If you think about this equation in words, it becomes a lot easier to solve. This equation in words is saying that I need to find y. Let me put this a different way. Actually, let me say this, let me say this in, in words a different way. I need to find y prime so that when I take the derivative, I get y back. So I want to take the derivative and get my equation back. We know that when I take the derivative of exponentials, I get the exponential back. So this suggests to us that the solution to this ODE is going to be uh, in the form of y naught is equal to something times e to the uh, negative x, because that is the function that we know of, that when I take the derivative of it, I get my uh, function right back, which is what this equation is saying in words. So that y not should equal something, we'll call it a, times e to the negative x. a is a constant. And here's the problem. We have a second order ODE. ODE. We have two boundary conditions. We have looked at the order one solution. We integrated to solve for y not, and we have one unknown constant. So 
to me, this makes the, the kind of inherent challenge of singular problems much more clear. Because you get here and you're saying, I have a differential equation that I'm trying to solve. It has one unknown constant and two boundary conditions. It's overdetermined. What do I do? How do I, how do I, which boundary condition do I use to solve it? And the tricky thing is, is that sometimes um, you can't use either boundary condition to solve the, to solve the problem. The way to think about this, or at least the way I think about this, is to plot your solution. So what we have here is something that looks like this. Y is a function of x. And y is uh, an x, it goes as a times e to the negative x. So there's two options. Either a is positive, in which case we get this curve. Or a is negative, in which case we get this curve. The, uh, the mirror of the other curve. Remember that our problem is defined only over the domain x from 0 to x is equal to 1. So there's nothing we have to worry about happening in the negative x regime or above x is equal to 1. And so this, these are the only two options here. So our solution tells us that, well, we can either have the red curve or the blue curve. And remember, the question we're trying to answer is, what boundary condition do I apply? And so then my question to you is, what boundary condition do I apply? Can you apply both and sum them? Or they valid over like two regimes or something? You cannot apply both. Um, and I I'm hopeful that you'll be able to determine what to apply just based on what I've kind of drawn here. Yeah, I think you and Susan just said the exact same thing. Uh, we have to apply the second one. So the blue curve is never going to help us. It's never going to zero and it's never going to one. So the, we clearly A is going to be positive. And as was just mentioned in the chat and in the classroom at the same time, it's the red curve is clearly never going to zero. It's asymptotically shooting up towards infinity as, as X gets closer to zero. The only chance we can have here is to fix the endpoint at one. So clearly this is approaching some value. We don't know what value, but we could constrain it to be one. Whereas this thing is never gonna go back towards zero. So we can't apply this boundary condition here at all. We can only apply this second one. Oops, I totally wrote that wrong. Y at one, sorry everyone, is equal to one. This kind of conceptual thinking through the problem is really important. So if, if you didn't see it immediately, I want you to try to make sure you can see it now. We can never apply that boundary condition or put it a different way. If I try to apply Y at zero is equal to zero, and solve for an A that would make that happen, you would not be able to find an A. There's no constant that will allow you to do that. And so the only option you have is to use the other one and solve for um, A knowing that Y at one has to equal one. So if we do that, we find that A equals E. Oh. 
Why is my definition y1 and not y0? Oh, yeah, yeah, Nope, that's just because I totally typed it wrong. Oops. I was made a lot of typos over here. Yeah, thank you. So that's that's the uh, perfect. Okay. So the only amount of addition we can apply is that at, at x is equal to 1, we expect the value of y. And in this case, our part of our guess of our solution, y not, to be equal to 1. And by forcing that to be the case, we find that a is equal to e, where e is the, uh, the exponential, the, the 2.41. Um, and so we can combine these. We can kind of insert these things back together and find that y not to first order should look like e times 1 minus x. Conceptually, are people, is this making sense? We should know by now, we are veterans of this, that we can take this out to higher order. We can go out to order epsilon. And we know we're not going to resolve this problem of being able to apply the other boundary condition. It's not going to, it's still going to have only one uh, constant of integration. And that constant of integration is still not going to allow us to figure out what's happening at x is equal to zero. But we can do it anyway because it gives us a better approximation for the outer solution. So at order epsilon, this looks like y naught double prime plus 2y1 prime plus 2y1 equals 0. Hopefully this looks, this is clear to you. So if I, let's see if I can just do that. If I look back over here at order epsilon, it's this term that's being retained. This and this gives you an order epsilon squared. So this term, this and this term is order epsilon, and this and this term is order epsilon, which is exactly what we're bringing down here. And we've canceled out the epsilons because you basically have epsilon times all this stuff equals zero. And so therefore the epsilon goes away. Going to higher order, we can still only apply that one boundary condition, that one that we found that, that uh, is reasonable. So we, we can, we don't even have to write down the other one. We can acknowledge that what we're interested in is that y1 at one equals zero. Oops. Yeah, no. and remember, this is the tricky part. We've already enforced, remember our boundary conditions are here. Um, let me go up here. At first order, we said that this term has to be equal to one. So at order epsilon, if this term, if the other term I highlighted in yellow, the y naught of one equals one, then the only way for this equation to main true, maintain being true for all orders of epsilon is for all the terms that you're adding onto y not at 1 to be equal to 0. So everything that I'm highlighting here in orange has to be equal to 0. This is the point that often confuses people because people, what people will typically do is kind of inherently make this boundary condition look the same as this one. But we've already said that equals one. So everything else that in that summation, that power series term, summation has to be equal to zero. So that's the first kind of wrinkle in solving these problems is that we have to change that boundary condition that we're looking for. We solve this thing in general. 
So it's a bit harder to do off the top of your head. So you can do it with Mathematica pretty quickly to find that y1 is equal to some other constant b minus x over 2 times b to the 1 minus x. We apply our boundary condition to solve for b. And we find that y1 should equal 1 minus x over 2 times e to the 1 minus x. And lastly, we remember that this is just the coefficient. So if I go back up here, I just want to remind you that you have to kind of insert everything back into your equation. Take y1, add epsilon times, sorry, y0 plus epsilon times y1. This is y1. So we've just really solved the coefficients here. And so then our kind of up to order epsilon solution looks like this. y is equal to 1 minus x plus epsilon times 1 minus x over 2 times e to the 1 minus x. Okay, how are we doing here? Would people like to see some of this in Mathematica? Are people comfortable with all this? Can you go back to your order of epsilon? So you took your term that you found for y naught and plugged that in for y naught double prime. Correct. Then, so, yep. And then again, you just uh, solve the rest of the ODE. That's Correct. It's usually good. Yep. Which is a little bit tricky to do, uh, you know, off the top of your head. But yes, exactly. You're taking y naught here, which is equal to uh, e to the 1 minus x, inserting it here. So you're taking two derivatives. That's where you're going to get that kind of uh, 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 term multiplying the exponential appearing. And then we apply the boundary conditions to solve. Uh, and solve the, uh, the ordinary differential equation and apply the boundary conditions. Let's see if I can show what this looks like. So what have you really done? Oh, I switched the plot to log log. That's going to be confusing. OK. Well, I switched the plot. Oh, sorry, log linear. Um, let me show you what the other solution looks like. So in a, in a log x plot, let me see, I'll just plot this all in linear, sorry. Um, well, I'll leave it as is so I don't break anything. So what we've really done here, if I'm just going to zoom into this plot here. The plot is not in linear linear anymore, which is why it looks a little different. The black line is analytical, the red is numerical. Um, the green curve is what I want to draw your attention to. The green curve is what we are finding for the outer solution. And what you can see is that basically from when the boundary layer width ends around n, almost 10 to the minus 4 in x, we see that our order epsilon solution does really, really well at predicting uh, how this boundary value problem behaves towards that outer boundary condition. So it matches what we would expect to find as long as we're not near the boundary layer. So the outer solution works away from the boundary layer. This is the regular, we use the regular perturbation to get here. We're able to figure out what's happening away from the boundary layer. 
to figure out what's happening inside the boundary layer, we're looking at the, uh, the singular part of this perturbation. So the idea is we have this part, what we'd like to find is how this part behaves from near the boundary uh, to the uh, to some point dictated by the magnitude of epsilon. Again, reorient yourself in terms of thinking about this like maybe a like a uh, fluid flow uh, over a wedge, where you have some flow that's behaving. Uh, near the rigid interface that's going to behave differently than the flow far from the rigid interface. The outer solution, which we obtained through a regular perturbation, tells us how that flow would behave away from the, from the boundary layer, away from the wedge, kind of in the bulk. And then the next step we do is to figure out what's happening in the boundary layer, ignoring anything that's happening away from the boundary layer. And that, that's where we're at at the moment. Questions? Can you go back to what the, what the, what the overall solution is? Yes, this is the solution of order epsilon. And it's just. Um, I had a question about the boundary condition at y naught of zero. Yeah. Do we re do we neglect that condition and set it to zero, or because um, um, if y naught of one is uh, e to the one minus, oh sorry, yeah, if y naught of one is e to the one minus x, that wouldn't like um, that wouldn't solve the equation y naught of zero equals zero, right? Correct. This can only solve the equation far from uh, the origin, far from x is equal to zero. So this approximation, the regular perturbation method here, will give us the outer solution, outer being far from the, the origin in this case. And so this solution basically can only tell us what half the curve is going to look like. The conceptual, I see. Okay. and this conceptually what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to do a change of variables. We're going to do the dominant balance to figure out how to properly rescale our equation. And then we're going to solve what's happening near the origin. And we're going to ignore the other boundary condition, the one we already applied. So, um, and so we're just going to focus on what's happening near the origin. And the end result of that, we will have one curve that's telling us what's happening near the origin, a second curve that's telling us what's happening away from the origin. And our the, the final thing we do is we have to say, well, if I have an approximation that's working near the origin and I have an approximation that's working far from the origin, then they should, there should be some point where those two things have to match up so that I have one continuous solution that, that behaves um, uh, from zero to one. Right now, I have, you know, only a part, of, I can only tell you what's happening far from the origin. We've ignored one of the boundary conditions. And the next step is we're going to is we're going to work on what's happening near the origin and ignore the, the boundary condition at x is equal to one. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Other questions? Okay, take a second. So the next step is we've, we've done the regular perturbation. To figure out what's happening next, we have to, oops. We have to consider the, a singular perturbation. Why do we have to consider a singular perturbation? Because when we took epsilon to zero, we lost th 
this term. Therefore, we lost the ability to apply two boundary conditions. We reduce this from a second order to a first order, which doesn't help us because we actually have two boundary conditions. We know how the system should behave at x is equal to zero. We know how the system should behave at x is equal to one. So by the fact that this epsilon is multiplying the highest order derivative changes the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve. And so now we have to rescale this problem such that when epsilon gets smaller, this term remains really important, remains dominant. Right now, when we did the regular perturbation, as epsilon got smaller, this term became inconsequential. We lost the ability to apply, to say anything about what's happening near the origin because this term went away. The way we fix this is by rescaling our equation such that we can make sure that this term that contains the second derivative always remains dominant. And then we can, once we've found that rescaling, do a regular perturbation in, in our new scaled variables to approximate what's happening and then convert everything back. So here again, we're, these are oftentimes what's referred to as your, your boundary layer coordinates. So right now we're kind of in our regular coordinates and we're going to switch to some boundary layer coordinates. We're rescaling the problem. And the way we rescale the problem is we say that let's take a new X, we'll call it X bar. I did capital X last class, but it's hard for me to write a capital or a small, make it clear what I'm talking about. So we'll just do X bar. is equal to x over epsilon to the gamma. Change in variable here, once again, just like when we were trying to non-dimensionalize our equations, whenever you're changing your variable, you have to consider what happens to the derivatives when you're changing things, and you're going to need to apply the chain rule to properly make these substitutions. So for instance, the operator d by dx is equal to d x bar by dx, d by x bar. d by x bar is what we want. We want a new differential operator that's going to operate in our new coordinate system, not in our old coordinate system. If I do this, I get 1 over epsilon to the gamma times d by dx bar. If I do this again, because we need a second derivative here, you can work out the math, but this should give you 1 over epsilon to the 2 gamma times the second derivative operator. Accordingly, we're going to also change y of x to y bar of x. Oops, y bar of x bar. There we go. Remember, we're rescaling the spatial coordinate for the boundary layer. So that's why we're using this substitution here to rescale our x axis. What we'd really like to be able to do is kind of account for the fact that in this, oops, in this region over here, our x axis almost gets stretched or compressed depending on the magnitude of epsilon. We don't really, you know, we're not interested primarily in what's happening. Um, in this y stretching, what we're really saying is that as I change epsilon, I'm stretching the width of this boundary layer. So I want to work in a coordinate system that corresponds to the coordinates of the boundary layer. And that's what this variable substitution is referring to. We change the boundary layer so we're in the uh, boundary layer coordinates. 
And then we rescale y just for the sake to re remind ourselves that we're kind of living in y bar, which is describing what's happening at x bar. Okay, so now our original ODE looks like this. All right, over here. So it's epsilon to the y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y equals zero. And our new uh, rescaled variables look like this. Epsilon to the one minus two gamma times y bar double prime plus two epsilon to the negative gamma times y bar prime plus two y bar equals zero. And then the other bound conditions remain the same. Okay, we have a new problem. We've rescaled our ordinary differential equation. We rescaled it by dividing x by epsilon to the gamma. We don't know what gamma is. The next part of the problem is using the method of dominant balance to uh, determine the magnitude of, of gamma. So I'd like you to take a moment and try to work through this dominant balance. Remember, we need to make sure we keep this term, we want to balance this term with either this one or this one to find what gamma will be, ensuring that as epsilon gets really small, this term remains dominant. So the end result of your dominant balance when you do term one and two or, and term one and three is that you will have those terms be on the same order as each other. The question is, as epsilon gets smaller, are those two terms that you balanced always large? If so, you have a consistent balance. If when you balance those two terms, they are small relative to the third term in the equation, as epsilon gets smaller, then you have an inconsistent balance. And remember, just for the sake of uh, being completely clear, to do this balance, you need to take the, the, the what is eps, the exponent of epsilon and set them equal to each other. So take a few minutes and work out the dominant balance and uh, let me know what you find.
How are people doing? I can't tell if I figured it out or if I'm massively underthinking it. Hmm. All right, no worries. Is anyone who maybe has the ability to write on the screen or does anyone want to kind of walk through what they did and, and what they found? All right, cool, thank you. Um, Susan, do you want me to sh let you share your screen or do you just want to talk through? I'm trying to like quickly send this to myself so that I can share it on the screen because I don't have the best way to share it on the screen, but I figured I would still volunteer because someone else did. Cool. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, me or oh, while you do that, I will slowly figure out how to make you co-host. Have it. I might be oversimplifying it, but let's see. Um, so let me know, and you can see the screen. Yep, you can see it. So, using that method of dominant balance, I basically um, took the original equation, the rescaled up at the top. If you can see my pointer, um, and I started first with just doing terms one and two because it has to be one and either two or two or three. Um, so I did the first two first. Um, and setting the epsilons to the same, really setting the exponents to the epsilons the same. So you end up with um, one minus two gamma equals negative gamma, because that's um, what's the epsilon um, coefficients up the top, or sorry, powers. Um, and that yields gamma equals one. Um, and if you plug that back into your equation, both your first and second term end up with an epsilon to the negative one. Um, and just looking at that, your y double prime and your y prime will both um, go up as epsilon gets smaller and smaller because it's really one over epsilon. Um, so I was like, that's probably the correct answer, but I also did the other one just for kicks. Um, and that one, you have one minus two gamma equals zero because there's no epsilon in the last term. Um, and so, I mean, solving through for gamma, you get gamma equals one half, but just conceptually, you know that, well, that's obviously going to make epsilon go away. In the, y, in the first term, the y double prime, because you just set it to go away. Um, so unsurprisingly, you end up with the, you end up with a equation at the end when you plug in gamma equals one half that has no y double prime term. Um, and thus I said, you should use the first one balancing terms one and two, and that gets you an epsilon to the negative one term. Perfect, that's exactly correct. Thank you. It, it, this, this type of the dominant balance can kind of simultaneously feel like uh, either confusing and befuddling or like what you did, what I think two of you said, which is like, maybe I'm making this too easy because I just found it and it's not that hard. And I think that's commonly the case. Like, I think it's not one of those things that's like, incrementally more difficult. It's either like you are confused or you're like, oh yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and it's okay if, if you're still confused with this, this is very new. So I, that wouldn't surprise me. It's, it makes sense. Um, but you did that exactly right. That's the exact way that I want you to do it is to um, grab the exponents, set them equal to each other, solve the gamma. Um, you're going to have two epsilons that have the same exponent in your resolving equation. And the idea is what happens uh, to the magnitude of this term as epsilon goes to zero. So you're exactly right. Um, gamma here has to equal one.
And knowing that gamma is equal to one, then we know what our differential equation looks like, which is that y bar double prime plus two y bar prime plus two epsilon y bar equals zero. You'll note that I wrote this equation a little bit differently than how Susan wrote it. I just took and multiplied uh, through by epsilon, both sides of the equation. And part of the reason for doing that is it makes uh, your life easier when you're um, doing a power series expansion. Um, but the other reason is just to conceptually, so you can now see very explicitly that upon doing this variable substitution, I now clearly have a regular perturbation problem. The epsilon is now no longer multiplying the highest order derivative in my equation, and I proceed like a normal regular perturbation problem. It's just that my regular perturbation problem is in a different coordinate system, one in which I've kind of stretched my x axis depending on the magnitude of epsilon. I've rescaled my x axis depending on the magnitude of epsilon. Okay. So now we have to solve, and we do the same thing we just did before. We are going to make the same type of, of uh, guesses we have done over and over again. And we are going to guess that our answer is that y bar of x bar is equal to y bar naught plus epsilon y1 and so on. And we insert this into, into our governing equation. Our new equation becomes y not double prime So I forgot the bars on all these. And then we proceed just like a regular perturbation. And we say, okay, well. You know, at order one, all I need to worry about is this term, this term, and the other term goes away. So I guess I should just do this term. So at order one, we would say that y bar not double prime plus 2y bar not prime equals zero. The, there's kind of two ways you could think about this problem. The simpler way is to say, well, this problem had two boundary conditions. I've already used one. So clearly I need to use the other. Or you can work through that same thought exercise before and just kind of solve it generally and say, well, what boundary condition does it make sense for me to apply? And you're going to find that, well, it only makes sense for me to apply the one that works near the origin. We've already applied why not of one is equal to one. So so we have to apply the one that remains, which is that y bar not at zero equals zero. This is a second order ODE. 
we're going to end up with two, uh, two unknown constants. So y naught is equal to r is equal to, let's switch to capital letters, capital A plus B. That's e to the minus two x bar. I don't know that off the top of my head. That's something I would ask my faculty to tell me how to do. Um, um, are they capitals because they're now matrices instead of constants, or is it just to tell them apart from the earlier um, ones? No, no, these are still scalars. Um, I'm just using capital to, because uh, we're in like the inner solution. So these constants are kind of unrelated at the moment into what's happening in the other one. So I, I could have gone with like, lowercase c and just continued. Either way, it's fine, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have to apply our, our one boundary condition that we know we have to apply. And you can kind of already sense a brewing problem, right? Like, well, I have one boundary condition and I have two unknown constants. What do I do? Well, the first thing you do is just apply, apply the boundary condition and that you have, and that's gonna yield a solution for, for B. And what you're going to find is that y not is equal to a times 1 minus e to the minus 2x. I think it's just because we solve for B and it ends up giving you like uh, no, you just is equal to no, we don't know. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, we don't know A right now. I'm just saying we solve for B and it's going to give you something that's like X to E to the uh, you found you found B was equal to like negative A or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, here I want to pause for a second. So again, I didn't do any of these by hand. I did this by kind of uh, um, solving the ODEs in Mathematica. What I want you to do is, I plotted this, as you recall, in uh, semi-log. The reason I plotted it in semi-log where I was logging the x-axis is because if epsilon is really small, that boundary layer is ridiculously short. Like the, uh, on the width on the x is really short. So it just looks like a vertical line. So it becomes really hard to qualitatively distinguish like a vertical line from like a slightly less vertical line. So I plotted it in a log x way, semi-log. Uh, if you plot this, our solution that we just found so we plot y bar as a function of x bar. I want to show you what's going to happen. You're going to get solutions that look like this. Oops. where the magnitude of the line that this thing asymptotes to, so like the value here or here or here, depends on that constant A. What I want you to see is that the application of our only remaining boundary condition got everything to work when we're near the origin. And then starts to get funky when you get away from the origin. Another way to say this more mathematically is that why not 
goes to A as X bar, oops, sorry, Y bar, goes to infinity. Which is what I'm trying to articulate with this with this um, uh, diagram here. It's going to plateau at some value. The value of plateau is at a, and it's going to plateau at that value as x gets larger. Now our system is there is bound to x is equal to one, so you can even just do this as like as x goes to one, it's going to be equal to a. Um, but conceptually, what I want you to think of is that our approximate solution tends to some value a as x gets bigger, and the first purpose of this singular solution is to tell us what's happening near the origin, near x is equal to zero. So what do we do with this solution? I should point out, by the way, if you solve this in Mathematica, you'll get an equivalent answer that looks mathematically different. And unless you're particularly good with uh, uh, various trig identities, um, it will be confusing to you like as it was to me, which is that if you do this in Mathematica, you're going to get this solution. It's going to say that the constant, they're, they're calling that one, uh, where this thing, this whole quantity is A, is equal to E times E to the minus 2x bar times e to the minus 2x bar minus 1. So if you're playing along in Mathematica, you're going to get a solution that looks different, but it's actually the same. So I didn't know that, but if you plot them, you get the same exact curve since they're not obvious to me. But. OK. So it seems like we have a problem in which we have an approximate solution for what's happening uh, on the on the outer side of the problem, so near the boundary of x is equal to 1, we have an inner solution that is, seems to work pretty well for what's happening near the origin. But we have this unknown uh, remaining constant of, uh, that came from our integration, um, this, this capital A. And so what do we do? Well, what we do is we use this unknown constant to match our inner solution to our outer solution. And it kind of conceptually makes sense, right? Because like we just saw that as y not goes to, uh, sorry, as x goes to infinity, y not goes to a. So it kind of would make sense to say, well, if I came from the other direction, shouldn't I be able to match up what's happening from my outer solution to a and have those two things kind of just hit each other? And that will dictate like the, the transition from the inner to the outer solution. And that's exactly what you are doing, what we're going to do. So let me introduce this. This is step three, which is which is the matching for the match asymptotics. Conceptually, I'll just draw out what we have. Conceptually, what we have is this. I haven't gone through the process of rescaling our variables yet, but we will do that. But conceptually, what we have is, let's call the outer solution this purple. One and my inner solution is And we know that our analytical solution or the actual solution is something like this. Uh, no, I don't. 
maybe I'm exaggerating that curve, you know, the, the apex of that curve, but kind of scrolling up. We have two approximations. One that is 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 accurate as x gets larger, and one that's accurate as x gets smaller. And this curve here, this blue curve, will shift up or down depending on the magnitude of x. I'm sorry, magnitude of a. And what we would like to do is have one matched asymptotic expansion. A composite solution of these two of the inner and the outer that actually gives us one curve that spans the entire domain. And that's the last step. So our purple curve we, we took out to order epsilon just for the sake of flexing our muscles. We didn't really need to, we could have stopped it order one like we did for the singular perturbation, or we could have kept going for the singular perturbation. Let me write that a little bit bigger, sorry. Sorry. And our blue curve. Is that y bar? Is it with some constant? That's e to the minus 2x bar. That's e to the, uh oh. I think I wrote this down wrong up here. I'll have to check it in my knowledge later. Oops. Where this is A. Okay. Conceptually, what we're doing is we're matching the limits of these two solutions. We're saying, as x goes to zero, I know my inner solution is right. And as x goes to infinity, I know my outer solution is right. So I want to take the two solutions I have and kind of ensure that they match up. So, for instance, the limit as x goes to zero of y, if we can mathematically calculate this. What is the limit of y as x goes to zero? Well, you can plug this in uh, to your favorite uh, mathematical program. If you don't know off the top of your head, I don't. The limit of y as x goes to zero is one half e times two plus epsilon. It's easier to conceptualize this if you ignore the order epsilon term, because the limit as x goes to zero of y in that case is just going to be e. Right, because we had found that at order one, we have basically this term up here as x goes to zero. This is going to give you just e. Then the, the limit itself gets a little more complicated uh, as you go to order epsilon. So I'm just calculating what the limit is. I already told you what the limit is up here, or I showed you with a graph, but I'll just write it out to be kind of clear mathematically. The limit of y bar as x bar goes to infinity is going to equal our constant c1 over 2 or our constant a, depending on which way you wrote the solution. To match the inner and outer solutions, we have to require that these two limits are equal. So we have to say over here, let's move over here. That's 
the limit as x bar goes to infinity should equal the limit of y as x goes to zero. These two curves, we know they're going to each work well in their respective domains. And as they head towards the other domain, they should approach the same value because they have to. We're looking for one continuous solution that works over the entire domain. We have an approximation that works for large x, an approximation that works for small x. As the good approximation for large x gets smaller and the good approximation for small x gets bigger, they should at some point approach the same value. Is, is this the same thing as, um, well, no, this isn't the same thing, but could you also set the derivatives of each one with respect to x equal to each other? So you take your purple curve uh, or your expression for your purple curve and take the derivative with respect to x. Take the expression for your blue curve and make the derivative with respect to x. And the idea is whatever the intersection point is, it would just be continuous. I don't know. That's a good question. I've never done that. I don't have, I will have to try that and see if it works, but I, I don't know the answer. I can, I can imagine. The slope is the same rather than saying that as is the same. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's yeah. exactly what it's saying. I don't know. I, yeah, I guess I don't. It's not obvious to me that the slopes. Maybe, yeah. Because, like, if you look at this graph, the slopes are not. Well, I mean, I've just hand drawn it, but the slopes are clearly at least of a different sign. So maybe they're equal and opposite, but that's not obvious to me either that that would generally be the case. But would it always be continuous, or would the function be? Yeah, I mean, so this is a good question. In case people online can't hear, is 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 it fair to assume that we're going to have a continuous solution? Uh, in general, yes, because. You know, you're assuming your differential equation is continuous and integrable and uh, like, like, you know, has some level of like, in this case, C2 differentiability. How many times can you take a derivative of this thing and have it remain continuous? So in that sense, we have no reason to, I think we are essentially saying when we set down to solve it that we expect it to be continuous mm -hmm. uh, over this domain. There are cases in, in continuum mechanics that where you, where you have um, like jump conditions, like so you have some sort of like moving front, and then there's like a jump in some condition. But those can kind of be be treated um, as additional kind of constraints on on the solution that you're looking for. So, like, but yes, like if you have a shock wave or something. Shock like, wave, yeah, exactly. You can say that that's the boundary condition itself. Exactly. Okay, so conceptually, I, I hope it makes sense why we're setting these two limits together. And the result of that mathematically is just to take the two things that we found and set them equal to each other. So they both have a half, so we can ignore that. I'll just leave it in for the sake of clarity. C1 over 2 is equal to 1 half. B times two plus epsilon. And now we can just we immediately, very quickly, um, take these halves, and then we've immediately found what C1 has to be. C1 has to be E times two plus epsilon. This is our other unknown constant. We can either write whatever you're comfortable with. We're going to have to do one more step here. But I want to just make it clear to you that at this point, it is perfectly valid to write that why not 
at zero is equal to y bar naught at infinity, which is equal to e times t plus epsilon. Okay, we have one last step. This last step is a little bit confusing, but I, I encourage you to play with this kind of um, in Mathematica to see if you can um, see why this is necessary. The last step, or I guess the last part of this matching is to construct the composite solution. And the composite solution is found in general by writing it like this. Y in our real coordinates is equal to the inner solution plus the outer solution minus the matching condition. If you don't subtract off the matching condition, you end up double counting it because you kind of you have the matching condition for uh, y, you have the matching condition for y bar, so you would kind of end up double counting it. And so, if you were to not do it, you would find that like your solution looks good, but then it's kind of like double what you would expect it in in a particular region of space. So you always are, to find your composite solution, you're taking the inner solution. You might have more than one inner solution. We'll talk about that next class. Um, adding it to the outer solution and taking away the matching condition. If you have more than one inner condition, inner solution, you'll have more than one matching condition. So you have to take away all of your matching conditions. So what this looks like, so the inner solution is, what is this, my blue one? So the inner solution is why not bar at x bar my outer solution is y not of x plus y one of x oops plus epsilon times y one of x and my matching condition you can pick either or, and you can write, just don't pick both. You can either pick y not at zero, or if you want, they're the same, or you can pick y bar at infinity. So this matching condition is one of these two. So I'm going to box this in green. Oops. You might be wondering yourself at this point, is it valid that we took the outer solution out the order epsilon, but we took the inner solution only out the order of one? What is what happens when we do that? I'm sorry, what was the question? If you, you'll notice that my I took the outer solution and we solved it out the order epsilon, but the inner solution we only solved out the order one. So what is the, is that okay? And if so, why? Yeah, tell me about the nature of the approximation. I mean, it's just because, because of the nature of the inner solution, taking it to the order one has everything on the same level as when the outer solution is to the to the epsilon that makes sense that's a good that's a good guess it's um that's a good guess what i'm looking for and it's actually even even simpler than that our precise exactly our our, our solution here our composite solution is going to do better for larger x and be a little bit worse for smaller x and so if that's a problem like you really need to know what's happening on uh, near the boundary then you can take that inner solution out the higher order. And if you don't really care about what's happening in the outer solution, you can kind of take that to a lower order. Or, you know, probably 
the best thing to do would be to take them both to the same order, but I, I was lazy here. Uh, did I do this backwards? I think I did this backwards. Sorry. Actually, I'm going to do this order. Let me write this in blue. Um, oh gosh, did I actually do the other one to order epsilon? Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Oops. Um, well, so remember before we do this part that we need to take this thing and change back. To Y and X. So kind of rescaling, remembering that X is actually X bar is actually equal to X over uh, epsilon to the uh, minus one. I think uh, I kind of annoyingly ended up going through the inner solution as to order epsilon, running it down. So apologies for that. Let's see if we can just do this by hand though. So what does this tell us? Oops. What does this tell us? So the inner solution is um, E times 2 plus epsilon times E to the minus 2 X over epsilon times E to the 2 X over epsilon minus one. I should have written that all in blue. Sorry. This one's all in purple. Our other one is pretty straightforward. It's just, actually, what is it? It's And I'm subtracting off the matching condition, which is E times 2 plus epsilon. Let me just highlight these for you. Inner. Outer. The end result of all this is a curve. Sorry, I'll bring that back in one second. The end result of all this is a curve, what, what color have we not used yet? Uh, maybe pink? There's a curve that does this. And we have a composite solution, a matched asymptotic expansion that approximates this boundary value problem. First, by doing a regular perturbation to figure out what's happening, away from the boundary, the inner boundary where that boundary layer is occurring, then doing an, uh, a change of variables, a method of dominant balance to find what that change of variable should be, rescaling the problem into our uh, boundary layer coordinates, finding the inner solution, which is our blue curve. Then we had one leftover boundary condition. We used understanding how the inner solution should behave as X gets bigger, needs to become equal to the, how the outer solution behaves as X gets smaller, matching those two together, 
which literally means kind of matching the limits on y in x in those two different domains yields a matching condition that allowed us to determine the constant of integration which we plugged into our inner solution and then we have to subtract it off when we combine our composite solution by summing up the inner outer and taking away the matching and by doing all of that we came up with an approximate solution to a second order differential equation what i would like you to do before next class is to try to implement this in mathematica I skipped a lot of steps, or I don't even know if I skipped them. I kind of just told you a lot of things. Like I told you the solution to these different differential equations at different orders. Um, you don't have to implement this all in Mathematica. You can do, you know, I think doing that dominant balance by hand is a lot simpler than doing it in Mathematica. Doing kind of grabbing the terms at each order is a lot simpler to do it by hand at times. But I would like to see if you can implement and get these solutions to the differential equation, the matching. And in particular, what I'd like you to do is see if you can analytically solve the equation, numerically solve the equation, and plot our approximate matched asymptotic uh, solution to the equation all on one graph. I want you to do this before next class because if you are unable to do this you're going to really have a miserable time with the homework and so i'd like to know that uh, before thursday question This is a really small question, but in your inner solution, when you wrote it in the composite, is it supposed to be E times two plus epsilon over two? Because isn't the two, isn't the E times two plus epsilon just your C one term that's supposed to be over two? Oh, that's not a minor question. That's a good catch. Yeah, you're, you're right. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I don't know. I, yeah, I was, uh, I was being sloppy there. Nice catch. And then, in this case, the matching is actually C1, not C1 over 2. Yeah. Yep. So it's C1 over 2 multiplies that inner solution. Thank you. Can you just use A for that? Is that okay? Oh, it's totally fine to just use A. You would end up with like A. Uh, 2a, I think, for the matching condition. Yeah, like the happen. only reason I introduced the C1 is that if you solve this thing in Mathematica, you're going to get a different curve and it's going to be confusing. Yeah. Why is the matching condition just C1? Good question. Um, here's why. What ends up happening is that, so here's C1. But look over here. What C1 implies is that y not at zero is equal to this, and y prime at x is equal to infinity, x bar is equal to infinity, is equal to this. And so what happens is because of these two things appearing, you end up double counting this. You kind of because you have this being being true and this being true, this term here, which is C1, will enter your approximate solution twice. So you need to take away one of them because you double count it. You really just need to kind of impose the fact that they're going to match up. But when you stick it back into your equations, you're going to end up double counting it. And I'd like you to, to when you're playing with this in Mathematica, 
like try constructing your composite solution just by adding the inner and outer solution and see how it's wrong. Like you'll see, like, oh yeah, that's it's over predicting in this region. Um, and so uh, like you should be able to check that out. But the reason why it's C1 is because both of this is equal to C1 and this is equal to C1, we're double counting. Me off though is it looks like if y it says y of zero is equal to e times two plus epsilon, but the limit of y as x goes to zero is c1 over two, not just c1. That one, yeah, or I guess one half e times two plus epsilon, but also the same as one half c1. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So sorry, I guess you would both have. I guess both of these, you have one half on both of them. Well, now I'm not really, now I'm confusing myself. I lost the two. I see what you're saying. You're saying this is not C1. Yeah, so I guess both of them give you C1 over two. Well, that'll be something that I will check when I go back to my Mathematica notebook. Like, I think we should, I'll check if you have to subtract off C1 or C1 over two. I think it's just C1, but I'll, that's a good question. And I, I've perhaps confused myself. Yeah, uh, I'll double check that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there's a question in the chat of why can't we use the second boundary condition to solve for A when we initially took the change of variable? Uh, let me remind you what we did up here. Um, we got to here. And this yielded a second order differential equation in which we have only one boundary condition. We've already used the other one, and we, this solution shouldn't work at all uh, near the inner, uh, near the outer solution. So we can only use that one boundary condition we have left. And using that one boundary condition will only solve from one of these two constants. And in this case, we ended up solving for B. And we're left with one constant. So basically, once we did the vector change of variable, we still had two constants of integration and only one boundary condition to use. I'm I guess I'm just confused. So, so why do we only have one boundary condition left? Like, let's say we didn't do the regular perturbation problem and we just did singular perturbation. Why couldn't we use uh, both boundary conditions? Um. I guess the answer even the second boundary condition that we used in the regular perturbation problem become invalid when we moved to the single. Yeah, I think what, but I think you're right that we you know we can't use it. But I think what Jacob is asking is like, why can't we just skip the regular perturbation problem and just apply two here? When you have the same problem that you with the regular. I think you end up with the same problem where like yeah. one of them will, will actually give you a solution and the other one is, will not. And I will double check that, Jacob, and we can jump on uh, office hours later if that helps. But I think you end up with the same problem where you can really only apply one and the other one doesn't get you to the value you want. Sorry for being short on this one. I'm just, I know over time and I want to give people a chance to get to their next class. But we can jump on uh, office hours if you want. Um, and we can try it out and see if it works. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. I'll see you all on Thursday.